Warning, this episode of The Confession deals with sexual assault. Just go to Google that. It's about um, a friend of yours, and it's a so um, it's um, about a man called Gilead. Okay. Eleven years before Katya Piliotis was charged with the murder of Elia Abdul Mesa, police questioned another woman in connection with his death. Her name was Susan Louise Reddy. To her friends and family, she was Sue or Susie. To some of the police, she was Crazy Sue. He's talking about a week and a half ago. Is that okay? Oh, you're joking. Yeah, and we just want to know um, when you last saw him, you know, when you were in his house you're last. Sure? Sorts of things. Yeah. Oh, no, that's not funny. I'm Richard Baker, and this is episode three of The Confession. On September 28, 2005, eight days after Elias' brutally bashed body was discovered in his East Q home, homicide detectives Warren Ryan and Wayne Newman went searching for Sue. Uh, We'd spoken to some um, individuals from the Q colleges who um, knew Mr. Abdul Hasia, and um, her name was uh, provided to us by, by those people as someone who may have known him. That was Detective Ryan in 2020 explaining to Supreme Court Justice Elizabeth Hollingworth why he wanted to talk to Sue. And this is Crown Prosecutor Angela Ellis. And what was the purpose of attending? Were you trying to take a statement? Were you intending to arrest her? What was the, what was the intention? Uh, to establish her knowledge of um, the deceased and um, initially um, we asked her to provide a statement and she, she was conveyed to the Q police station for that purpose. The preliminary conversation that you had with Ms Reddy, that was recorded? Yes. Then she formally attended the police station for the purposes of a, of a recorded interview, is that right? Yeah, following um, going to the Q police station, the Burundara police station, uh, we were instructed by our superiors to take her to the homicide squad and conduct a formal interview. Our initial approach was to take a statement from her. What changed your approach? Uh, our superiors. Over the course of two interviews recorded within hours of each other, one unofficial and taped without Sue's knowledge, and the other under caution but recorded with her consent, Sue went from being a witness to a suspect in a liar's murder. Large extracts from these recorded interviews were played to the jury members who would determine if Katia Piliotis was guilty or innocent of the murder. I also know a girl from Q named Sue Reddy. James Hodgkinson was another person from the Q area who gave a statement to Detective Ryan as part of the investigation into Elias' murder. This is an actor reading from his statement. I usually saw Sue at the seats in front of Safeway in Q. I would sit and drink wine with Sue in front of the Safeway. I would usually buy my wine for about $5 and so would Sue. Hodgkinson and Sue would sometimes beg for money outside the supermarket. Sue was funny when she would ask for money. She would make up all sorts of stories, like her mother had died and she needed money for flowers. Alyssa Colono was the assistant service manager at Safeway Supermarket in 2005. Sue is about mid-40s. Light shoulder length, untidy hair, wide rim glasses, usually wears grey track pants. We heard parts of her statement in the last episode voiced by an actor. Here's more. Sue is usually drunk and hangs around the front of the store. Sue is very sneaky in how she begs for money. She nearly always picks females and goes up to them and pretends to cry. She then tells people that her sister has died and that she needs money to buy flowers for her sister. She even tried this routine on me. I told her I knew it wasn't true and that I knew who she was and what she was up to. Sue then apologised repeatedly and I think she thought I was going to call the police. Ante Tava was another of Sue's companions on the seats outside Safeway. He told police Sue had also tried to shake him down for $5. An actor is reading Tava's statement. I told her I wouldn't give her any money, and then she told me to get fucked. Sue is quite a big woman, about my height. She's solid. Fat? No. She walks with a limp, just a fraction. 
I don't think she's normal. Swearing, begging for money, drinking. She has blonde hair, speaks English excellent. I would say she's Australian. The suburb of Kew, where Sue hung out and Aliyah lived, is the kind of place where you see what you want to see. On the surface, it has more than its share of attractive and successful people who live in spacious period homes, drive flash cars and send their kids to private school. But Kew's also long been home to a group of people whose lives haven't been so blessed. The kind of people who, if we're being honest, most of us at some point in our lives have chosen not to see. In the chaos, one firefighter recalled hearing screams that would smoke already down to new level and couldn't establish where they were coming from. Those news grabs were from 1996, when a fire ripped through a supported residential care place called Kew Cottages, killing nine male residents. It sparked a community uproar, and a royal commission was held into how society cared for its most vulnerable. Some things improved as a result, but take a walk around the streets of Melbourne right now, and you'll see we've still got more work to do. For more than a century, Q is where the state has housed its physically and intellectually disabled. In the 19th century, the Q Cottages site was officially called the Idiot Ward. By 2005, Sue Reddy's supermarket drinking buddy, James Hodgkinson, was living in a place with a more poetic name, a supported residential home in Q called Willow House. 47-year-old Sue lived at another supported residential house in Q run by the Urala Charity. And this was where detectives Ryan and Newman found her just after 9am on September 28, 2005. They wanted to talk to Sue because witnesses, including Hodgkinson, Tava and supermarket manager Colono, had said that she and Aliyah knew each other well. Aliyah's neighbour, William Taylor, remember he's the one who called police to Aliyah's house, had also given police a description of a woman resembling Sue being at the Elmgrove house a few months back. Sue had also been seen getting into Aliyah's car in the supermarket car park. And on the weekend Aliyah was murdered, Sue was missing from her Urella home. I know him. I know him very much. His house is a mess. It's, you've been to his house? Yeah. Been to now we're talking about the right person. He didn't have a heart attack. The house was looking like. He used to always come down to the Maccas, right, at about nine o'clock in the morning. The audio quality of Sue's first recording with police, the covertly taped one, isn't flash. We've cleaned it up as best we can. From the outset, Sue was chatty with the police and never sought to hide the fact that she knew a liar. But she wasn't easy to interview. Sue had an acquired brain injury, possibly caused by a fall from a building where she'd been fighting on a balcony or a rooftop. And one of her favourite pastimes only made things worse. I'm an alcoholic too. I don't do anything. No, I used to. Um, like I used to go here for four hours, and I felt freedom. You know, it's great. If you didn't catch what Sue said, she told the police about the freedom she felt from going on a bender. It was hard for the police to get Sue on track. Harder still to keep her there. For a while, Sue thought the detectives were asking her about another man, not a liar. Eventually, she got her head around it. But she would often interrupt the flow of conversation to say things like this. I'm not lying, mate. It's, I'm I'm telling you, you two guys, am I helping you? Yeah. So, I hope so. Yeah. You are because, as you said, it was alone. At other times, Sue clearly understood what was being asked of her and had a great insight into the human condition. Of a liar, she said. He never used to smile, so I used to say, come on, smile, and he'd come on, smile, you know, and he'd, oh. <laughs> he used to, he looks nice when he used to smile. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He wants somebody to make him feel alive. Yeah. He's lonesome. He just asked me if I want to smile. That was Sue explaining to the detectives how a liar had a nice smile and how he needed her to make him feel alive. 
Sue may have developed a hard exterior to protect her from the rough crowd she mixed with, and maybe from herself, but underneath was an almost childlike sense of fun, someone who just wanted to be liked and to get along. Take this exchange with Detective Newman. Yeah, I've got a daughter and she's a teacher in high school. Is that right? How old she is? 24. To their credit, detectives Ryan, Newman and their colleagues went out of their way to ensure Sue understood why they wanted to talk to her and assured her that she wouldn't upset them if she chose not to answer their questions. An independent observer was present in both interviews to provide Sue with support. But for all her eagerness to please, Sue was uncomfortable when it came to describing what she and Aliyah actually did together. What was your relationship with Ilya when you went uh, to his house, Matt? Oh, God, you killed me. Mate. <laughs> We're all adults. Oh, think, yeah, I know, We're all grown-ups. I know, I know, but it's a bit embarrassing. I'll tell you something. Um, he used to make love for $20. Yeah. And that's why he was going down there. Sue later explained how Aliyah would approach her in the Safeway car park and ask her to come to his house. This had happened as many as 15 times in the past two and a half years, she said. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll keep pissed at it. Sits with him. Okay. When they got to Elias' house, Sue told the detectives that he'd pour her a bourbon and put on a porn film. As we just heard Sue say, she could only sleep with him if she was drunk. And what would happen then? That's when he wanted me to go into his room yep. and do that dirty thing that I'm Can you tell me what the dirty thing is? What could you do? What, what would we do? Yeah. Listen closely to Sue in this next bit. The recordings of Sue's interviews with the police show her attitude towards a liar could switch in an instant. He was nice. He was a nice man. But he was lonesome. Yeah. He was very lonesome. He's stubborn, bitch. <laughs> He's very and stubborn. He, He's got a good heart. care about him very much. But he's strict. Once he wants, he wants it his own way. Because he gets angry. He gets very angry back to you. For me, I was a real He's very a sleazy bitch sometimes, you know. <laughs> he was. <laughs> In time, Sue went on to reveal much more about her sexual interaction with a liar. What comes next is hard going, and best heard when kids aren't within earshot. Sometimes I used to stay by the, the, um, uh, the bed, and he used to do up a pool and fun, you know? Yeah. Did he and give you extra money for that? That's what I, was, that's what I thought. That's what I thought, mate. But no gush? No. no. Ripped off? I know, mean, I should have been up to about, but he got 50 bucks. Probably. That's what I thought. Yeah, selling yourself short. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know, mate. It's cruel. It's cruel. It's cruel. It's cruel. It's cruel. After revealing Elias' seemingly unwelcome anal sex, Sue asked the detectives for a favour. But don't spit it out to all the police. It's a hard thing. No, 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 no. No, it's just... What? I'll tell you now, it's confidential. Yeah, yeah. Seems like I feel like I want to cry. It's nice. If you didn't hear the last thing Sue said after revealing her intimate secret to the police, she said she felt like crying. It wasn't an easy decision for me to play that last bit of audio, given Sue's acute discomfort in revealing her experience and her request for confidentiality. It's obviously deeply personal and painful for her. But in the end, I felt the details of Sue's unsettling sexual relationship with a liar were just too important to overlook. They provide for Sue Reddy what the lawyers prosecuting Karchipiliotis have never been able to. A motive. I'm aware that some of the details revealed in this episode will also be distressing for family and friends of Aliyah abdul Messa, who, like Sue, lived a full and complex life with light and shadow. After weighing it all up, I believe that justice demands it. Now, let's get back to the events of September 28, 2005. During the interview at Urala, Sue was also able to tell the police about the state and layout of Elias' house with reasonable precision. Detectives Ryan and Newman had heard enough. It was time for Sue to come to the station and make a formal statement about her dealings with Elias. Initially, Ryan and Newman sought to take her to the Kew police station, 
But after a chat with their superiors, Sue was taken to the Homicide Squad office in St Kilda Road near Melbourne CBD. Before they left, Sue wanted to do one thing. Is it all for me? I'm going to go and have one tag and then I'll go out with you. Yeah. And you're going to put that at the police station. When she finished, one of the policemen picked up her cigarette butt and placed it in a plastic evidence bag. We heard earlier how Sue went missing from the Urala home over the weekend when Aliyah was killed. These are some of the people she was hanging out with. I'm currently working as a prostitute in St Kilda. I work on Grey Street mostly. When I work, my boyfriend Jordan spots for me. Marissa Lewin told police how she and Sue kicked off the weekend by getting together on Friday night at the Willow House boarding rooms in Kew. They gathered in a room being rented by a man called Chris Ross. Chris's girlfriend at the time, Tiffany McPhee, was also there. An actor is reading Lewin's statement. Chris got some speed and Chris, Tiffany, Jordan and I used the speed. Sue wasn't in the room when we used the speed. She came in afterwards. I don't think Sue uses drugs. She just drinks wine. Marissa Lewin went to work in St Kilda that night and Chris and Jordan went with her. Tiffany and Sue stayed back at the boarding house. After a sleepless night, Lewin told police she and her friends were still speeding when they returned to the Q boarding house. There... They found Sue lying naked in Tiffany's bed. All but Sue decided to go get breakfast from the Sacred Heart Mission in St Kilda. The cycle of drinking, charity meals and sleeping it off continued over the weekend. Sue spent the night with us and the three of us all had sex together. At some stage during the night, Sue called me a dog and Chris got upset with her. Despite this, Sue slept in our room And when Sue woke up Sunday morning, she started to drink wine from a cask straight away. That's what Tiffany McPhee, voiced by an actor, told police about Saturday night and Sunday morning. What McPhee had to say next is important. During the day on Sunday, Chris and I went to cash converters at Smith Street, Collingwood, to put Chris's toolbox on loan for some money for wine. Sue stayed in our room drinking and sleeping. But McPhee had no idea whether Sue had actually stayed in the room or had gone somewhere else. The trip to cash converters to raise 60 bucks for drinking money left Sue without an alibi for a couple of hours. McPhee told police that Sue was definitely back in the room when they returned later on Sunday. Sue was happy with us because we brought more wine. According to McPhee, the trio stayed in the room for most of the day, drinking and having sex. They went to the Salvation Army venue in Box Hill for dinner before going back to bed. McPhee said Sue did ask her to do one favour. Sue said she felt dirty and asked me to wash her clothes. McPhee told police she took Sue's denim shorts and white top to her place nearby and washed them and put them in the dryer. When she got back to the queue boarding room, Sue wasn't there. She was downstairs talking to police. Sue wasn't yet a suspect but police had been informed by staff from Urala that she'd been missing for the weekend and police were asked to try and find her. Sue had a towel wrapped around her and her glasses and that's it. Sue was taken away by the police. Tiffany McPhee said she and Sue had only known each other for about a month. Sue, I intend to interview you in relation to the death of uh, Elia Abel, Abdel Essamaya. Before continuing, I must inform you, you're not obliged to say or do anything, but anything you say or do may be given in evidence. Do you understand that? Yes. This is how the second interview between police and Sue began on September 28, 2005. It was held at the Homicide Squad's headquarters and it was serious business. Detective Ryan wasn't involved in this interview, but Detective Newman, the colleague who'd been at the first interview with Sue at Urala earlier that day, was. So was another detective called Tim Argel. One thing that needs to be perfectly clear here, okay, (laughs) 
if you decide to answer a question, Sue, or not answer the question, yes, that recording can be oh, played at court. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sue didn't seem all that impressed with the detective's attempts to inform her of her rights. Oh, God, I'm not supposed to. No, I know you're not. The detectives asked her if she remembered the last time she was with a liar. I saw it was on Sunday, right? right. I remember I was pissed, yes. like a, right? Yeah. I was drunk like a dog because I was mm. like, I went to the bottle shop and bought our cars. And then she said something unexpected. And I don't know why because I, I must have... Ex- uh, slowly, I've got to hit the roof. Yep. Because one thing I cannot remember, it's a, it's a weirdos, I cannot remember what I would have grabbed anything. I would have grabbed it, you know, whether it was like a rock, because he's been hit. I would have hit him. Okay. No, no. I'll, look, I'm not going to lie, mate. Yeah. It's a trick. But I must have, I've got no idea. I ran out through the door. Why? But when I fucking fight, mate, they're going to be in hospital. Okay. I fight them hard, okay. mate. It's cruel. It's cruel because I'm a good fighter. Yeah. Sue went on to tell the police how a liar would lure her with offers of cash, and not much cash at that. Twenty dollars. Fifty, but he was a pusher. Okay. He wants his own way. And I said to him, look. Once again, Sue took the police through a liar's sexual demands. She said she would ask, "Can I just pull it?" But a liar would make her bend over. That's why I used to think, oh, God, I feel like I'm in hell. I'm not in heaven, I'm in hell. You know, I'm still in me 20 bucks. And I think it's a bit of a rip-off, but that's money is better than nothing. Sue volunteered some other things to the police during this interview, such as she'd spent 20 days in a women's prison and had hepatitis C. And then this. Mm. I've been raped twice in Darwin. Okay. That's a killer. I hate it. I hate it, mate. Just lie there, go through hell. An hour into the interview, the detectives slowed things down. Okay, we'll now suspend the interview. Uh, we're just going to have a quick break. Oh, God, you agreed that time is now by my watch, uh, 4.40 p.m.? Yes. Okay, we'll, we'll suspend the interview. I don't know anything more about Sue Reddy other than what she told police during her two interviews and what others said about her as part of the coroner's inquest. As we can hear, Sue is cognitively impaired, but her carer at Urala, Ross Bracken, told the police that Sue would have been capable of living independently had she not had a drinking problem. This is a recommencement of a tape called interview between Detective Senior Constable Newman and Susan Louise Reddy of 300 Cotton Road Q, conducted the Homicide Squad office on... Wednesday, the 28th of September 2005. Persons present is my corroborated Detective Sergeant Tim Argle of Homicide Squad and independent third person, Mr Cliff Fisher. Mr Fisher, can your presence, please? Independent third person, Cliff Fisher. Sue, do you agree the time is now by my watch, 21 minutes past 5pm? Yes. Sue told the detectives how she could lash out when she was drunk but had trouble remembering what, if anything, she might have done. Once, she said, she hit her mum so hard she put her in hospital. You know, all people who are really, they're pierced. Yeah. They used to go from good to bad. Even my mum, she's an alcoholic, she had brain damage. She used to go from good to be bad. Like, it's just the way when you're pierced. Yeah, okay. They don't mean you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just the same as me too when I used to get pierced, paralytic. I was going from bad, I mean, good to bad, you know. Okay. And that's what happened with me and with him, mate. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Because when he's, you know, because when I was drunk, you know, and mate, when I was, somebody rocked the song, it's one person, I couldn't give a shit up, I just wanted to shut up. Mm. Towards the end of the interview, Detective Newman asked Sue some very direct questions. So is it possible that um, you have done something to Ilya and you can't remember because of yes, alcohol? Yes, 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 yes. Do you recall going to Ilya's house on Sunday? I can't remember, mate. I can't remember. Do you recall that? But, you, but did you say to me that I was there on Sunday? Is that right? Well, I'm only telling. I'm only going. Oh, like you've told me. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought you might. No, I can't remember. Is it possible there. you were there? Well, how would I get there anyway? I haven't got a car. Is it possible oh, he's picked I know you up? Another guy's got a car. No, we went down to the bottle shop. That was on um, Saturday. Oh God, I don't know. 
I don't know. How much had you had to drink that weekend that you that you went away from? Um... Oh, heaps every day, every day. I was sick, but I had no food. I had a shower. I pushed myself. There's a chick there. She's filthy. Her room. I was just some goes. Sue's brain injury and heavy drinking made it extremely difficult for the detectives to pin down her movements and dealings with a liar over that weekend, and her tendency to agree with whatever someone had just said to her could be a problem if things ever made it to court. The police needed more if they were to charge her, something like DNA evidence. So they turned off the tape recorder and returned a tired Sue to her supported accommodation. Police then issued a search warrant on Tiffany McPhee in an attempt to find Sue's clothes, but they were never recovered. They also secretly recorded their conversation with McPhee, and this is how we know that some of the police referred to Sue by a nickname. Years later, Katja Piliotis's barrister Dermot Dan got a transcript of this recording and asked Detective Newman, now a superintendent, and Detective Argel about the description of Sue. This is courtroom audio from 2020. First off is Dan questioning Argel, followed by Newman. You started off that meeting, I suggest, by saying that, uh, explaining to Miss McPhee that the reason we're here, we want to talk to you about Susan, you know, crazy Sue. Does that sound familiar to you? Uh, That's possibly a term I may have used if other people had referred to her as that. I might have used that as a reference to to help um, orientate the conversation towards the person. You conducted a field interview with uh, Miss McPhee, is that correct? Yes. Which was tape recorded? Yes. And in that field interview, uh, Miss McPhee uh, commenced telling you, and when you asked questions about Sue, you and uh, Mr Argyle were asking questions about Sue or Crazy Sue, as she was referred to in that field interview. Do you recall that expression being used, Crazy Sue? Yes. When the police took Sue back to her Urala home, they executed another search warrant on the staff there. They seized a pair of blood-stained Puma sneakers and a blood-spotted white towel. We'll come back to those sneakers in another episode. All in all, it had been a long day for everybody, most of all Sue, who'd been with the police pretty much since the morning. But she wasn't done talking yet, just not to the police. After the police left, I entered into Sue's unit and Sue requested me to have a private talk. I'm pressing pause for a moment here to make something clear. This podcast isn't about trying to prove Sue's guilt or Cartier's innocence. In an ideal world, that's the job of the justice system. This series is about how the police find evidence and how the justice system more broadly decides what weight to give the various bits. It's about how the prosecution and the defence use that evidence to prove or disprove a case and about whose story gets heard. Ross Bracken was Sue's carer at Urella. Unlike Sue, Bracken seemed a reliable witness. He was responsible for the care of seven residents with acquired brain injuries and was well regarded. Sue trusted him. He wrote a report on his conversation with Sue. Here's an actor reading it. Me and Sue went into the bedroom. Sue said, I've got something bad to tell you, mate. You know what they're talking about? I asked Sue, did you do it? Sue began to cry and proceeded to inform me that she went over to the now deceased's house where she was going to perform sexual acts on him. She explained to me that she had quite a lot to drink and was extremely intoxicated. She said the deceased was speaking rudely to her. She asked him to stop. However, he continued. Sue then informed me that something in her head snapped. She picked up an item, which she described to me as a glass ball paperweight object, which was clear or white in colour. She then informed me that she repeatedly hit the man until he collapsed. She informed me that the blood sprayed over her face, hands and all down the top she was wearing, the top she had on at this time. She then proceeded to wash her hands and leave the deceased's residence. She 
She then informed me the next thing she remembers is being at Willow Lodge on 18 Barker's Road, Hawthorne, where she asked someone to wash her clothes. Bracken's report states that police pulled the Urala staff aside when they brought Sue back from the station and told them they believed she was involved in the murder of a liar. They were looking for further information to confirm this or exclude her. But in the meantime, the Urala staff should consider Sue a possible threat to their safety and that of other residents. Police informed me to keep a close eye on Sue in case she decided to do a Thelma and Louise or harm herself. After hearing Sue's apparent confession, Bracken reported it by telephone to Detective Ryan. This happened at about 9.30pm on Monday, September 28, 2005, the same day Sue had already been interviewed. Strangely, Bracken's news didn't appear to excite the police too much. It took them six days to take a formal statement from Bracken. And Sue was never asked to come into a police station again to answer questions about what she'd apparently confessed to her carer, that she'd bashed a liar about the head with something hard until he collapsed, that blood had flown everywhere. Ryan didn't even include Bracken's statement in the inquest brief for the coroner. I have to say that I find this lack of follow-up by the police astonishing. Turns out I'm not the only one. I still haven't understood why, based on this very unsatisfactory interview, you've decided at that point to exclude her as a suspect, particularly in the light of Mr Bracken's comments, the, the, the statement that he gives you. I just don't understand the thought process. Please, can you explain to me why she's been written off by you at this stage? Oh, I, I, I can't, Yura. Just that, that, was the, that was just the view that I took at that stage. And I'm, whether I'm right, wrong, or it was a clumsy decision to come to, that's what, that's what I'd reached. That's audio of a courtroom exchange in 2020 between Justice Hollingworth and the now Superintendent Newman. Here's another that also involves Crown Prosecutor Angela Ellis. Was Ms Reddy still a person of interest at that point following the statement made by Mr Bracken? I would say to other members she was, absolutely. To me, no. Why? Because, as I said to her, I've formed a view... um, at that stage that she had no involvement. Why? Based on what, though? My interaction with her, Your Honour. The vibe. What on earth? You've, don't you have an open mind about a murder investigation? You've got someone who's been at the house. What had she said? Or what we'll hear a lot more of the police attempting, and often struggling, to explain all sorts of things to Justice Hollingworth in upcoming episodes. It's extraordinary listening. But going back to 2005, Newman's belief that Sue wasn't their killer a belief that was perhaps shared by others within the Homicide Squad crew, was bolstered on October 31, when DNA taken from a cigarette butt discarded by Sue failed to match with any of the DNA found at the crime scene in Elias' house. We know that DNA was called Unknown Female One, and it would remain a mystery for another 11 years, until one autumn day, Katja Piliotis would be pulled over driving an unregistered car in South Australia and asked to give a DNA sample. I planned to ask Karcher if she knew Sue Reddy back in 2005. My thinking was that if she did, then maybe Sue had asked her to come to Elias' house to help deal with the chaotic scene. Unfortunately, Karcher's lawyers advised she couldn't answer questions like this. I'll explain why later. So we are left to rely on what Karcher said during those recorded phone calls she made to her family from prison in August 2016 for clues as to what might have really happened at Elias' house that day. This is something that just doesn't add up. And they can't... I just, I'm, not, I'm not settled with the idea that there's no other person's fingerprints in that premises. That's, that's, that's bullshit. You know, when I found him, he was well and truly gone. So the police will have, they will be able to find more fingerprints. Because I, I, I said I used the person's um, bathroom sink to wash my hands, to wash the blood off my hands because I touched him. They're going to find my fingerprints on him because I touched him. They're going to find fingerprints on the glass because I picked up the glass and I cut my hands on it. I told him all of this. It should be noted that at the time Cartier made these calls, neither she nor her legal team had any idea Sue had been interviewed under caution by police in relation to Elias' murder. To me, this makes it unlikely she suddenly devised a cover story about there being someone else at Elias' house that day. During one of these calls, 
Katya also revealed something important about the other person she said was at Elias' house. Um, the other girl who I went to the person's house with, um, they've unfortunately died, like, in a car accident a year later. So. The other girl. Katya never named the other person she said was at Elias' house on that day, so we can't know for sure who it was. What I can tell you is that Sue died in 2012. How? I don't know. A court record shows it was from natural causes, but the implications of her death would reverberate through this case and Australia's legal system in a way her life had not. I'm being stitched up with everything. There's no, um, yeah, I'm screwed. This isn't, this isn't fair. This is not. This is not what's supposed to happen in my life. I, I'm not. I'm going to have a lot of trouble understand. I'm not going to get any fucking closure. I'm going to have a hard time understanding why. Why did this happen to me? Like I did the wrong thing by not reporting his death when I found him. But I feel like I'm doing someone else's time. That's how I see it. As for Susan Louise Reddy, she was many things to different people. Friend, mother, fighter, daughter, lover, drinking buddy, pest and thief. To Katia Piliotis and her legal team, she was the centrepiece of their defence case. A reasonable doubt. Next time on The Confession. The wet cell's like, for me, it's like the worst part of jail. There aren't meant to be surprises in criminal trials. They're not meant to be great television. You're not investigators or gap fillers, you act on the evidence. The Confession is written and presented by me, Richard Baker. Our story consultant and co-writer is Kate Cole-Adams. Julia Carr-Katzell is our producer and editor. Director of podcasting is David McMillan. Tom McKendrick is head of audio. Michael Bachelard is the Ages Investigations editor. Sound design and mix by Kyle Hopkins. Technical assistance from Cormac Lally. Check out The Age and Sydney Morning Herald website for bonus material and for more of Australia's best investigative journalism. And if you've found any of the content of today's episode troubling, please contact Lifeline on 13 11 14. <laughs>